segment five, what it means for us. Mm -hmm. The next convergence. This is also a pretty compelling quotation, I think. Uh, got my attention, let's put it that way. Currently, the EU and the USA together account for 60% of G20 income, G20 being the 20, 20 most industrialized countries. No, it's the 20 largest countries. It includes I'm the sorry. big emerging markets. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that correction. Cool. By the middle of the 21st century, the mm -hmm. output of China and India will account for almost 60%. The United States and Europe by then will each account for 10%. It will be a very different world in terms of the distribution of economic power, mm -hmm. close quote. Okay, here's the first cut at it. Is the United States today experiencing what Great Britain experienced in the last century? Yes. It is. Yeah, we won't be dominant forever. We'll be, we'll, I think we'll live well. There's no reason to think we won't be competitive. It's not a zero-sum game. I mean, the global GDP will quadruple. And probably in the next 30 years with China and India and Asia in the lead, I mean, causing most of that increase. Mm -hmm. um, but, but if we are on top of our game, look, think of it this way, Peter. Yep. After World War II, we were dominant and we built up our enemies and, now, and the Europeans are now pretty effective, especially they have great companies that innovate, they compete with our great companies, and we're doing fine in that dimension. Then the Japanese came along, and we were a little scared in certain areas like autos. But, you know, basically, they've joined the global economy, and it's bigger. There's room for all of us. And, you know, 20, 30 years from now, we'll have China and India, and we won't be dominant anymore. But we'll be doing fine as long as we educate people, remain innovative, and so on. Mm -hmm. I find in talking to people that there's a worry that if they win, we'll lose. Right, right. And, and there is no need for that. Well, I can, okay, so, so let me push you a little bit on that. Mm. On the economic uh, arena, clearly, if they win, we win. If we win, they win. Everybody gets richer. Yep. I'm very happy to have a little extra disposable income because I can buy toys for my kids that were made in China, right? Yep. And the yep. prices goes down. Fine. Walmart lives because China has Absolutely. pushed prices down. Yep. Everybody's better off. Terrific. But on the military side mm -hmm. they can it is a gigantic completely unitary country they do as best i can tell they actually the leadership in beijing does make decisions for 1.3 billion people mm -hmm. and they can have a defense budget quickly mm -hmm. that places all kinds of pressure on us mm -hmm. i was talking to some um, australian friends the other day and they said well australia country of 23 or 24 million people way over there in the pacific which right now is doing very well because they're digging yeah. things out of the earth and selling them to this country of 1.3 billion. They're and this is a perfect example. Chinese growth benefiting Australians. But if it comes right down to it, and they say this very jokingly, but only half jokingly, if 50 years from now China decided it wanted Australia, it could just take it. Mm. So how do, you, how do you think about that? How do, you, how do you put at ease people who get edgy when they try to project their minds 50 years into the future and see the Pacific patrolled by sleek, technologically futuristic Chinese submarines. Well, you know, don't forget we're going to have two economic giants. And they, they're between them in how they interact and how they discharge the responsibilities that go with their size and power will have a great deal to do with how the rest of us do. And, you know, we can be optimistic or pessimistic or just say we don't know. But it is important there's going to be two of them. So we place our big geostrategic bets on the Indians. Well, on the balancing effect. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, but I think there's a reasonable change. You know, if, if there was only one of them. You just don't seem concerned by this, Mike. No, I think, I, I mean, look, at I care about the world that my children and grandchildren are going to live in. And if, 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 uh, if China or India or, God forbid, both of them turned aggressive with respect to the rest of us, once they achieve this position of relative dominance and don't behave the way we've behaved, then there is real trouble, mm -hmm. uh, a world of conflict. You know, but even between them, you know, I mean, they'll be 20 percent of the global economy, you know, each of them and the rest of us will be the other 60. The rest of us, if they got aggressive, would band together. Okay. Uh, so um, it may turn it. There's one thing I do want to say about this. Sure. One of the reasons China, Asia is resource poor, 
And they do have a legitimate fear that if they are militarily weak, then in a world of increasing pressure on natural resources, they could get cut off. They're really worried about that. And part when of the- you say resource weak, uh, uh, oil? Uh, yeah, just compare it with Africa. Africa's okay. knee deep in mineral, you name it, and they got it. Right. And, per, and especially per capita, and Asia tends not to. I mean, Japan's the extreme case, but, but Asia's resource poor. So the Chinese look around and they say, well, we have to be operating from a position of strength not because we want to be aggressive necessarily, but we can't be weak right. and vulnerable to being cut off. Right. Europe, mm -hmm. for um, how to summarize the problems quickly, uh, slower growth in the United States Except for from, Germany. From, from the 80s on, say. Yep. So you've got in France, which is, Germany is, the, is, is, is in the best shape economically. France isn't that bad. It's one of the great pillars of, of the European Union. And even there, you've had an unemployment rate of 9, 10% for some decades now. Among young males, it's 20 per, more than 20%. Yep. Um, and now, of course, we've got the tremendous pressure on the euro. Greece is fundamentally unproductive, aside from a center of tourism. Will the Germans put all kinds of problems with Europe? Question. Will the rise of China and the rise of India set a kind of example? What will, how will, how will Europe, or the United States for that matter, in policy terms, will we, will we respond to these two rising countries? Well, I, I think in the American case, well, no, yeah, let me take the American case because okay. we're at least unified. So we are either going to, you know, uh, my best guess is we'll muddle through and fix the fiscal situation eventually. We will probably cut out some of the sort of growth-oriented future, in, you know, oriented investments on the way through because that's what you do when you're under, you know, financial under stress, pressure, right? whether you're a country or a company. But eventually, I think we'll get back to our normal pattern, which is, you know, kind of being pragmatic and investing heavily. We're just under-investing now, Peter. We, we're under-investing in the aggregate. We're under-investing in crucial things like parts of education, in terms of effectiveness and infrastructure and, and some parts of energy and whatnot. And we're not even saving enough to fund our own investment. That's why we're running a current account deficit. And this has just eventually got to change or, or it will weaken us over time. Last question. Time Magazine founder Henry Luce, yes. famous essay right after the Second World War in which he referred to the 20th century as the American century. Mm -hmm. To whom does the 21st century belong? I think it's more dispersed. I think it'll, I think it'll belong to us and Europe and, uh, and Asia broadly, east and south. Uh, I, don't, I think we'll be, you know, we're on, a, we're on a journey where we started with the 15%, you know, at the end of World War II after this 200 years of divergence to, pray, I don't know what it'll be, 75 or 80%, mm. you know, who live like us right. if we right. don't destroy the planet on the way through and instead find ways to, to be less energy intensive and, and use the resources that we have in a gentler way. But I think we're clever enough to do that. And, and that's, that's, um, that's just a world in which there's a dispersion of economic activity and power. Michael Spence, author of The Next Convergence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us.